Preface I'd never given much thought to dying, though I'd had reason enough in the last few months. But even if I had, I wouldn't have imagined it like this. I stared across the long room into the dark eyes of the hunter, and she looked pleasantly back at me. At least it was a good way to die, in the place of someone else, someone I loved, noble even. That ought to count for something. I knew that if I'd never gone to Forks, I wouldn't be about to die now. But, terrified as I was, I couldn't bring myself to regret the decision. When life offers you a dream so far beyond any of your expectations, it's not reasonable to grieve when it comes to an end. The hunter smiled in a friendly way as she sauntered forward to kill me. Chapter 1. First Sight January 17th, 2005 My mom drove me to the airport with the windows rolled down. Though it was January everywhere else, it was 75 degrees in Phoenix, and the sky was bright blue. I had on my favorite t-shirt, the Monty Python one with the swallows and the coconut that mom got me two Christmases ago. It didn't quite fit anymore, but that didn't matter. I wouldn't be needing t-shirts again soon. In the Olympic Peninsula of Northwest Washington State, a small town named Forks exists under a near constant cover of clouds. It rains on this insignificant town more than any other place in the United States of America. It was from this town in its depressing gloom that my mom escaped with me when I was only a few months old. It was in this town that I had been forced to spend a month every summer until I was 14. That was the year I finally started making ultimatums. These past three summers, my dad, Charlie, vacationed with me in California for two weeks instead. Yet somehow, I now found myself exiled to Forks for the rest of my high school education. A year and a half. Eighteen months. It felt like a prison sentence. Eighteen months. Hard time. When I slammed the car door behind me, it made a sound like the clang of iron bars locking into place. Okay, just a tad melodramatic there. I have an overactive imagination, as my mom was fond of telling me. And, of course, this was my choice. Self-imposed exile. Didn't make it any easier. I loved Phoenix. I loved the sun and the dry heat and the big, sprawling city. And I loved living with my mom, where I was needed. You don't have to do this, my mom said to me, the last of a hundred times, just before I got to the TSA post. My mom says we look so much alike that I could use her for a shaving mirror. It's not entirely true, though I don't look much like my dad at all. Her chin is pointy and her lips full, which is not like me, but we do have exactly the same eyes. On her, they're childlike, so wide and pale blue, which makes her look like my sister rather than my mom. We get that all the time, and though she pre pretends not to, she loves it. On me, the pale blue is less youthful and more unresolved. Staring at those wide, worried eyes so much like my own, I felt panicked. I'd been taking care of my mom for my whole life. I mean, I'm sure there must have been a time, probably when I was still in diapers, that I wasn't in charge of the bills and paperwork and cooking and general level-headedness, but I couldn't remember it. Was leaving my mom to fend for herself really the right thing to do? It seemed like it was, during the months I'd struggled toward this decision, but it felt all kinds of wrong now. Of course, she had filled these days, so the bills would probably get paid on time, there would be food in the fridge, gas in the car, and someone to call when she got lost. She didn't need me as much anymore. I want to go, I lied. I'd never been a good liar, but I had been saying this lie so much lately that it almost sounded convincing now. Tell Charlie I said hi. I will. I'll see you soon, she promised. You can come home whenever you want. I'll come right back as soon as you need me. But I knew what it would cost her to do that. Don't worry about me, I insisted. It'll be great. I love you, Mom. She hugged me tightly for a minute, and then I walked through the metal detectors, and she was gone. It's a three-hour flight from Phoenix to Seattle, another hour in a small plane up to Port Angeles, and then an hour drive back down to Forks. Flying's never bothered me. The hour in the car with Charlie, though, I was a little worried about. Charlie had been really pretty decent about the whole thing. He seemed genuinely pleased that I was coming to live with him sort of permanently for the first time. He'd already gotten me registered for high school and was going to help me get a car. But it would be awkward. Neither of us was what you'd call extroverted. 
probably a necessary thing for living with my mother. But aside from that, what was there to say? It wasn't like I'd kept the way I felt about Forks a secret. When I landed in Port Angeles, it was raining. It wasn't an omen, just inevitable. I'd said my goodbyes to the sun. Charlie was waiting for me with the cruiser. This I was expecting, too. Charlie's police chief swan to the good people of Forks. My primary motivation behind buying a car, despite my serious lack of funds, was that I hated driving around town in a car with red and blue lights on top. Nothing slows down traffic like a cop. I stumbled off the plane into Charlie's awkward one-armed hug. It's good to see you, Bo, he said, smiling as he automatically steadied me. We patted each other's shoulders, embarrassed, and then stepped back. You haven't changed much. That was Renee. Mom's great. It's good to see you too, Dad. I wasn't supposed to call him Charlie to his face. You really feel okay about leaving her? We both understood that this question wasn't about my own personal happiness. It was about whether I was shirking my responsibility to look after her. This was the reason Charlie'd never fought Mom about custody. He knew she needed me. Yeah, I wouldn't be here if I wasn't sure. Fair enough. I only had two big duffel bags. Most of my Arizona clothes were too permeable for the Washington climate. My mom and I pulled our resources to supplement my winter wardrobe, but it still wasn't much. I could handle both of them, but Charlie insisted on taking one. It threw my balance off a little, not that I was ever really balanced, especially since the growth spurt. My foot caught on the lip of the exit door, and the bag swung out and hit the guy trying to get in. Oh, sorry. The guy wasn't much older than me, and he was a lot shorter, but he stepped up to my chest with his chin raised high. I could see tattoos on both sides of his neck. A small woman with hair dyed solid black stared menacingly at me from his other side. Sorry? She repeated, like my apology had been offensive somehow. Uh, yeah? And then the woman noticed Charlie. He was in uniform. Charlie didn't even have to say anything. He just looked at the guy, who backed up a half step and suddenly seemed a lot younger. And then the girl, whose sticky red lips settled into a pout. Without another word, they ducked around me and headed into the tiny terminal. Charlie and I both shrugged at the same time. It was funny how we had some of the same mannerisms when we didn't spend much time together. Maybe it was genetic. I found a good car for you. Really cheap. Charlie announced when we were strapped into the cruiser and on our way. What kind of car? I asked, suspicious of the way he said, good car for you, as opposed to just, good car. Well, it's a truck, actually. A Chevy. Where did you find it? Do you remember Bonnie Black down at La Push? La Push is the small Indian reservation on the nearby coastline. No? She and her husband used to go fishing with us during the summer, Charlie prompted. That would explain why I didn't remember her. I do a good job of blocking painful things from my memory. She's in a wheelchair now, Charlie continued when I didn't respond, so she can't drive anymore, and she offered to sell me her, her truck cheap. What year is it? I could see from the change in his expression that this was a question he was hoping I wouldn't ask. Well, Bonnie's had a lot of work done on the engine. It's only a few years old, really. Did he think I would give up that easily? When did she buy it? She bought it in 1984, I think. Did she buy it new? Well, no. I think it was new in the early 60s, or late 50s at the earliest, he admitted sheepishly. Ch Dad, I don't really know anything about cars. I wouldn't be able to fix anything that broke, and I couldn't afford a mechanic. Really, Bo, the thing runs great. They don't build them like that anymore. The thing, I thought to myself. It had possibilities, as a nickname at the very least. How cheap is cheap? After all, that part was the deal killer. Well, son, I kind of already bought it for you, as a homecoming gift. Charlie glanced sideways at me with a hopeful expression. Wow, free. You didn't need to do that, Dad. I was going to buy myself a car. I don't mind. I want you to be happy here. He was looking ahead at the road when he said this. Charlie had never been comfortable with expressing his emotions out loud. Another thing we had in common. So I was looking straight ahead as I responded. That's amazing, Dad. Thanks. I really appreciate it. 
No need to add that he was talking about impossibilities. It wouldn't help anything for him to suffer along with me, and I never looked a free truck in the mouth, or rather engine. Well now, you're welcome, he mumbled, embarrassed by my thanks. We exchanged a few more comments on the weather, which was wet, and that was pretty much it for conversation. We stared out the windows. It was probably beautiful or something. Everything was green. The trees were covered in moss, both the trunks and the branches, the ground blanketed with ferns. Even the air had turned green by the time it filtered down through the leaves. It was too green, an alien planet. Eventually, we made it to Charlie's. He still lived in the small, two-bedroom house that he'd bought with my mother in the early days of their marriage. Excuse me. Those were the only kind of days their marriage had, the early ones. There, parked on the street in front of the house that never changed, was my new, well, new to me, truck. It was a faded red color with big, curvy fenders and a rounded cab. And I loved it. I wasn't really a car guy, so I was kind of surprised by my own reaction. I mean, I didn't even know it would run, but I could see myself in it. Plus, it was one of those solid iron monsters that never gets damaged, the kind you see at the scene of an accident, paint unscratched, surrounded by the pieces of the foreign car it had just destroyed. Wow, Dad, it's awesome. Thanks. Serious enthusiasm this time. Not only was the truck strangely cool, but now I wouldn't have to walk two miles in the rain to school in the morning, or accept a ride in the cruiser which was obviously worst-case scenario. I'm glad you like it, Charlie said gruffly, embarrassed again. It took only one trip to get all my stuff upstairs. I got the west bedroom that faced out over the front yard. The room was familiar. It had belonged to me since I was born. The wooden floor, the light blue walls, the peaked ceiling, the faded blue and white checked curtains around the window, these were all a part of my childhood. The only changes Charlie had ever made were switching the crib for a bed and adding a desk as I grew. The desk now held a second-hand computer with the phone line for the modem stapled along the floor to the nearest phone jack. This was one of my mother's requirements so that we could stay in touch. The rocking chair from my baby days was still in the corner. There was only one small bathroom at the top of the stairs, which I would have to share with Charlie. But I had to share with my mom before, and that was definitely worse. She had a lot more stuff, and she doggedly resisted all my attempts to organize any of it. One of the best things about Charlie is he doesn't hover. He left me alone to unpack and get settled, which would have been totally impossible for my mom. It was nice to be alone, not to have to smile and look comfortable. A relief to stare out the window at the sheeting rain and let my thoughts get dark. Forks High School had just 357, now 58, students. There were more than 700 people in my junior class alone back home. All of the kids here had grown up together. The grandparents had been toddlers together. I would be the new kid from the big city, something to stare at and whisper about. Maybe if I had been one of the cool kids, I could make this work for me. Come in all popular, homecoming king styles. But there was no hiding the fact that I was not that guy, not the football star, not the class president, not the bad boy on the motorcycle. I was the kid who looked like he should, get, he should be good at basketball until I started walking. The kid who got shoved into lockers until I suddenly shot up eight inches a sophomore year. The kid who was too quiet and too pale, who didn't know anything about gaming or cars or baseball statistics or anything else I was supposed to be into. Unlike the other guys, I didn't have a ton of free time for hobbies. I had a checkbook to balance, a clog drained to snake, and a week's groceries to shop for or I used to. So I didn't relate well to people my age. Maybe the truth was that I didn't relate well to people, period. Even my mother, who I was closest to of anyone on the planet, never really understood me. Sometimes I wondered if I was seeing the same things through my eyes that the rest of the world was seeing through theirs. Like, maybe what I saw as green was what everyone else saw as red. Maybe I smelled vinegar when they smelled coconut. Maybe there was a glitch in my brain, but the cause didn't matter. All that mattered was the effect, and tomorrow would be just the beginning. I didn't sleep well that night, even after I finally got my head to shut up. The constant whooshing of the rain and wind across the roof wouldn't fade into the background. 
I pulled the old quilt over my head and later added the pillow, too. But I couldn't fall asleep until after midnight when the rain finally settled into a quiet drizzle. Thick fog was all I could see out my window in the morning, and I could feel the claustrophobia creeping up on me. You can never see the sky here. It was like that prison cage I'd imagined. Breakfast with Charlie was quiet. He wished me good luck at school. I thanked him, knowing his hope was a waste of time. Good luck tended to avoid me. Charlie left first, off to the police station that was his wife and family. After he left, I sat at the old square oak table in one of the three unmatching chairs and stared at the familiar kitchen with its dark paneled walls, bright yellow cabinets, and white linoleum floor. Nothing had changed. My mom had painted the cabinets 18 years ago, trying to bring some sunshine into the house. Over the small fireplace in the adjoining microscopic family room was a row of pictures. First a wedding picture of Charlie and my mom in Las Vegas, then one of the three of us in the hospital after I was born, taken by a helpful nurse, followed by the procession of my school pictures up to this year's. Those were embarrassing to look at, the bad haircuts, the braces years, the acne that had finally cleared up. I would have to see what I could do to get Charlie to put them somewhere else, at least while I was living there. It was impossible, being in this house, not to realize that Charlie had never gotten over my mom. It made me uncomfortable. I didn't want to be too early to school, but I couldn't stay in the house anymore. I put on my jacket, thick, non-breathing plastic, like a biohazard suit, and headed out into the rain. It was just drizzling still, not enough to soak me through immediately as I reached for the house key that was always hidden under the eave by the door and locked up. The sloshing of my new waterproof boots sounded weird. I missed the normal crunch of gravel as I walked. Inside the truck, it was nice and dry. Either Bonnie or Charlie had obviously cleaned it up, but the tan upholstered, upho- uphost- oh my goodness. But the tan upholstered seats still smelled faintly of tobacco, gasoline, and peppermint. The engine started quickly, which was a relief, but loudly, roaring to life and then idling at a top volume. Well, A truck this old was bound to have a flaw. The antique radio worked, a bonus I hadn't expected. Finding the school wasn't difficult. Like most other things, it was just off the highway. It wasn't obvious at first that it was a school. Only the sign, which declared it to be the Forks High School, clued me in. It looked like a collection of matching houses, built with maroon-colored bricks. There were so many trees and shrubs I couldn't see its size at first. Where was the field of the institution, I thought. Where were the chain link fences, the metal detectors? I parked by the first building, which had a small sign over the door reading front office. No one else parked there, so I was sure it was off limits, but I decided I would get directions inside instead of circling around in the rain like an idiot. Inside, it was brightly lit and warmer than I'd hoped. The office was small. There was a little waiting area with padded folding, Chairs, orange-flecked commercial carpet, notices and awards cluttering the walls, and a big clock ticking loudly. Plants grew everywhere in in large plastic pots, as if there weren't enough greenery outside. The room was cut in half by a long counter, cluttered with wire baskets full of papers and brightly colored flyers taped at the front. There were three desks behind the counter. A round, balding man in glasses sat at one. He was wearing a t-shirt, which immediately made me feel overdressed for the weather. The balding man looked up. Can I help you? I'm Beau Swan, I informed him, and saw the quick recognition in his eyes. I was expected, already the subject of gossip. The chief's son, the one with the unstable mom, come home at last. Of course, he said. He dug through a leaning stack of papers on his desk till he found the ones he was looking for. I have your schedule right here, Beaufort, and a map of the school. He brought several sheets to the counter to show me. Um, it's Bo, please. Oh, sure, Bo. He went through my classes for me, highlighting the best route to each on the map, and gave me a slip to have each teacher sign, which I was to bring back at the end of the day. He smiled at me and hoped, like Charlie, that I would like it here in Forks. I smiled back as convincingly as I could. When I went back out to my truck... Other students were starting to arrive. I drove around the school, following the line of traffic. 
Most of the cars were older like mine, nothing flashy. At home, I lived in one of the few lower-income neighborhoods that were included in the Paradise Valley District. It was a common thing to see a new Mercedes or Porsche in the student lot. The nicest car here was a brand new sil silver Volvo, and it stood out. Still, I cut the engine as soon as I was in a spot, so that the er ear-splitting volume wouldn't draw attention to me. I looked at the map in the truck, trying to memorize it now. Hopefully I wouldn't have to walk around it with it stuck in front of my nose all day. I stuffed everything in my backpack, slung the strap over my shoulder, and sucked in a huge breath. It won't be that bad, I lied to myself. Seriously though, this wasn't a life and death situation. It was just high school. It's not like anyone was going to bite me. I finally exhaled and stepped out of the truck. I pulled my hood down over my face as I walked to the sidewalk, crowded with teenagers. My plain black jacket didn't stand out, I was glad to see, though there wasn't much I could do about my height. I hunched my shoulders and kept my head down. Once I got around the cafeteria building, building three was easy to spot. A large black three was painted on a white square on the east corner. I followed two unisex raincoats through the door. The classroom was small. The people in front of me stopped just inside the door to hang up their coats on the low, long row of hooks. I copied them. There were two girls, one a porcelain-colored blonde, the other also pale, with light brown hair. At least my skin wouldn't be a stand out here. I took the slip up to the teacher, a narrow woman with thinning hair whose desk had a nameplate identifying her as Miss Mason. She gawked at me when she saw my name, discouraging, and I could feel the blood rush into my face, no doubt forming unattractive splotches across my cheeks and neck. At least she sent me to an empty desk at the back without introducing me to the class. I tried to fold myself into the little desk as inconspicuously as possible. It was harder for my new classmates to stare at me in the back, but somehow they managed. I kept my eyes down on the reading list the teacher had given me. It was pretty basic. Bronte, Shakespeare, Chaucer, Faulkner. I'd already read everything. That was comforting. And boring. I wondered if my mom would send me my folder of old essays, or if she would think that was cheating. I went through different arguments with her in my head while the teacher droned on. When the bell rang, a pale, skinny girl with skin problems and hair black as an oil slick leaned across the aisle to talk to me. You're Beaufort Swan, aren't you? She gave off the vibe of an overly helpful chess club type. Bo, I corrected. Everyone within a three-seat radius tur turned to look at me. Where's your next class? She asked. I had to check in my bag. Um, government, with Jefferson, in Building 6. There was nowhere to look without meeting curious eyes. I'm headed toward Building 4. I could show you the way. Definitely overhelpful. I'm Erica, she added. I forced a smile. Thanks. We got our jackets and headed out into the rain, which had picked up. Several people seemed to be walking too close behind us, like they were trying to eavesdrop or something. I hoped I wasn't getting paranoid. So, this is a lot different than Phoenix, huh? She asked. Very. It doesn't rain much there, does it? Uh, it's three or four times a year. Wow, what, mu what must that be like? She wondered. Sunny, I told her. You don't look very tan. My mother is part albino. She studied my face uneasily, and I stifled a groan. It looked like clouds and a sense of humor didn't mix. A few months of this, and I'd forget how to use sarcasm. We walked back around the cafeteria, to the south buildings by the gym. Erica followed me right to the door, though it was clearly marked. Well, good luck, she said as I touched the handle. Maybe we'll have some other classes together. She sounded hopeful. I smiled at her in what I hoped was not an encouraging way, and went inside. The rest of the morning passed in about the same way. My trigonometry teacher, Miss Varner, who I would have disliked anyway just because of the subject she taught, was the only one who made me stand in front of class and introduce myself. Excuse me. I stammered, went splotchy red, and tripped over my own boots on the way to my seat. After two classes, I started to recognize some of the faces in each room. 
there was always someone braver than the others who would introduce themselves and ask me questions about how I was liking forks. I tried to be diplomatic, but mostly I just lied a lot. At least I never needed the map. In every class, the teacher started calling me Beaufort, and though I corrected them immediately, it was depressing. It had taken me years to live down Beaufort. Thank you so much, Grandpa, for dying just months before I was born and making my mom feel obligated to honor you. No one at home even remembered that Bo was just a nickname anymore. Now I had to start all over again. One guy sat next to me in both Trig and Spanish, and he walked with me to the cafeteria for lunch. He was short, not even up to my shoulder, but his crazy curly hair made up some of the difference between our heights. I couldn't remember his name, so I smiled and nodded as he rattled on about teachers and classes. I didn't try to keep up. We sat at the end of a full table with several of his friends, who he introduced to me. Couldn't complain about the manners here. I forgot all their names as soon as he said them. They seemed to think it was cool that he'd invited me. The girl from English, Erica, waved at me from across the room, and they all laughed. Already the butt of the joke. It was probably a new record for me, but none, none of them seemed mean-spirited about it. It was there, sitting in the lunchroom, trying to make conversation with seven curious strangers, that I first saw them. They were seated in the corner of the cafeteria, as far away from where I sat as possible in the long room. There were five of them. They weren't talking, and they weren't eating, though they, had eat, though they each had a tray of food in front of them. They weren't gawking at me, unlike m most of the other students, so it was safe to stare at them. But it was none of these things that caught my attention. They didn't look anything alike. There were three girls. One I could tell was super tall, even sitting down, maybe as tall as I was. Her legs went on forever. She looked like she might be the captain of the volleyball team, and I was pretty sure you wouldn't want to get in the way of one of her spikes. She had dark, curly hair, pulled back in a messy ponytail. Another had hair the color of honey hanging to her shoulders. She was not quite so tall as, as the brunette, but still probably taller than most of the other guys at my table. There was something intense about her, edgy. It was kind of weird, but for some reason she made me think of this actress I'd seen in an action movie a few weeks ago, who took down a dozen guys with a machete. I remembered thinking then that I didn't buy it. There was no way the actress could have taken out that many bad guys in one. But I thought now that I might have bought it all if the character had been played by this girl. The last girl was smaller with hair somewhere between red and brown, but different than either, kind of metallic somehow, a bronzy color. She looked younger than the other two, who could have been in college easy. The two guys were opposites. The taller one, who was definitely taller than me, I guess six five or even more, was clearly the school star athlete, and the prom king, and the guy who always had dibs on whatever equipment he wanted in the weight room. His straight gold hair was wound into a bun on the back of his head, but there was nothing feminine about it. Somehow it made him look even more like a man. He was clearly too cool for this school, or any other I could imagine. The shorter guy was wiry. His dark hair buzzed so short it was just a shadow across his scalp. Totally different, and yet, they were all exactly alike. Every one of them was chalky pale, the palest of all the students living in this sunless town. Paler than me, the albino. They all had very dark eyes. From here they looked black, despite the range in their hair colors. There were deep shadows under all their eyes. Purple shadows, like bruises. Maybe the five of them had just pulled an all-nighter. Or maybe they were recovering from broken noses. Except that their noses, all their features, were straight, angular. But that wasn't why I couldn't look away. I stared because their faces, so different, so similar, were all insanely, inhumanly, Beautiful. The girls and the boys and the guys both. Beautiful. They were faces you never saw in real life, just airbrushed in magazines and on billboards. Or in a museum, painted by an old master as the face of an angel. It was hard to believe they were real. I decided the most beautiful of all was the smaller girl with the bronze-colored hair, though I expected the female half of the student body would vote for the movie star blonde guy. They would be wrong, though. I mean... All of them were gorgeous, but the girl was something more than just beautiful. She was absolutely perfect. 
It was an upsetting, disturbing kind of perfection. It made my stomach uneasy. They were all looking away, away from each other, away from the rest of the students, away from anything in particular as far as I could tell. It reminded me of models posed oh so artistically for an ad, aesthetic anyway. As I watched, the wiry skinned skinhead guy rose with his tray, unopened soda, untouched apple, and walked away with a quick, graceful lope that belonged on a runway. I watched, wondering if they had a dance company here in town. Excuse me. I watched, wondering if they had a dance company here in town, till he dumped his tray and glided through the back door faster than I would have thought possible. My eyes darted back to the others, who hadn't changed. Who are they? I asked the guy from my Spanish class, whose name I'd forgotten. As he looked up to see who I meant, though he could probably guess from my tone, suddenly she looked at us, the perfect one. She looked at my neighbor for just a fraction of a second, and then her dark eyes flickered to mine. Long eyes, angled up at the corners, thick lashes. She looked away quickly, faster than I could, though I dropped my stare as soon as she glanced our way. I could feel the patches of red start to bloom in my face. In that brief flash of a glance, her face wasn't interested at all. It was like he had called her name, and she looked up in involuntary response, already having decided not to answer. My neighbor laughed once, uncomfortable, looking down at the table like I did. He muttered his answer under his breath. Those are the Cullens and the Hales. Edith and Eleanor Cullen. Jessamine and Royal Hale. The one who was left. The one who left was Archie Cullen. They live with Dr. Cullen and her husband. I glanced sideways at the perfect girl, who was looking at her tray now, picking a bagel to pieces with thin, pale fingers. Her mouth was moving very quickly, her full lips barely opening. The other three looked away, but I still thought she might be speaking quietly to them. Weird names, old-fashioned, the kinds of names grandparents had, like my name. Maybe that was the thing here? Small town names? And then I finally remembered that my neighbor was named Jeremy, a totally normal name. There were two kids named Jeremy in my history class back home. They're all very good-looking. What an understatement. Yeah, Jeremy agreed with another laugh. They're all together, though. Royal and Eleanor, Archie and Jessamine. Like, dating, you know? And they live together. He snickered and wagged his eyebrows suggestively. I didn't know why, but his reaction made me want to defend them. Maybe just because he sounded so judgmental. But what could I say? I didn't know anything about them. Which ones are the Cullens? I asked, wanting to change the tone but not the subject. They don't look related. Well, I mean, sort of. Oh, they're not. Dr. Cullen's really young, early 30s. The Cullen kids are all adopted. The Hales, the Blondes, our brother and sister, twins, I think. And they're some kind of foster kids. They look old for foster kids. They are now. Royal and Jessamine are both 18, but they've been with Mr. Cullen since they were little. He's their uncle, I think. That's actually kind of amazing. For them to take care of all those kids when they're so young and everything. I guess so, Jeremy said, though it sounded like he'd rather not say anything positive. As if he didn't like the doctor and her husband for some reason. And the way he was looking at their adopt adopted kids, I could guess there might be some jealousy involved. I think Dr. Cullen can't have any kids, though, he added, as if that somehow made what they were doing less admirable. Through all this conversation, I couldn't keep my eyes away from the strange family for more than a few seconds at a time. They continued to look at the walls and not eat. Have they always lived in forks? I asked. How could I never have noticed them during my summers here? No. They just moved down two years ago from somewhere in Alaska. I felt a strange wave of pity and relief. Pity because, as beautiful as they were, they were still outsiders, not accepted. Relief that I wasn't the only newcomer here, and definitely not the most interesting by any standard. As I examined them again, the perfect girl, one of the Collins, looked up and met my gaze, this time with obvious curiosity. As I immediately looked away, I thought that her look held some, some kind of unanswered expectation. Which one is the girl with the uh, reddish-brown hair? I asked. I tried to glance casually in that direction, 
like I was just checking out the cafeteria. She was still staring at me, but not gawking like the other kids had today. She had this frustrated expression I didn't understand. I looked down again. That's Edith. She's hot, sure, but don't waste your time. She doesn't go out with anyone. Apparently none of the guys here are good enough for her, Jeremy said sourly, then grunted. I wondered how many times she turned him down. I pressed my lips together to hide a smile. Then I glanced at her again. Edith. Her face was turned away, but I thought from the shape of her cheek that she might be smiling too. After a few more minutes, the four of them left the table together. They were all seriously graceful, even the golden prom king. It was a strange thing to watch them in motion together. Edith didn't look at me again. I sat at the table with Jeremy and his friends longer than I would have liked. Longer than I would have if I'd been sitting alone. I didn't want to be late for class on my first day. One of my new acquaintances, who politely reminded me that his name was Alan, had biology too with me the next hour. We walked to class together in silence. He was probably shy like me. <laughs> Excuse me. When we entered the classroom, Alan went to sit at a black-topped lab table exactly like the ones I was used to at home. He already had a neighbor. In fact, all the tables were filled but one. Next to the center aisle, I recognized Edith Cullen by her unusual metallic hair, sitting next to that single open seat. My heart started pounding a little faster than usual. As I walked down the aisle to do my required intro for the teacher and get my slip signed, I was watching her, trying to make it covert. Just as I passed, she suddenly went rigid, rigid in her seat. Her face jerked up toward mine so fast it surprised me, staring with the strangest expression. It was more than angry. It was furious, hostile. I looked away, stunned, going red again. I stumbled over a book in the hallway, in the, in the walkway, and had to catch myself on the edge of a table. The girl sitting there giggled. I'd been right about the eyes. They were black, coal black. Mrs. Banner signed my slip and handed me a book with no nonsense about introductions and no mention of my full name. I could tell we were going to get along. Of course, she had no choice but to send me to the one open seat in the middle of the room. I kept my eyes down as I went to sit by her, confused and awkward, wondering what I could have done to earn the antagonistic glare she'd given me. I didn't look up as I set my book on the table and took my seat, but I saw her posture change from the corner of my eye. She was leaning away from me, sitting on the extreme edge of her chair and averting her face like she smelled something bad. Inconspicuously, I sniffed. My shirt smelled like laundry detergent. How could that be offensive? I scooted my chair to the right, giving her as much space as I could, and tried to pay attention to the teacher. The lecture was on cellular anatomy, something I'd already studied. I took notes carefully anyway, always looking down. I couldn't stop myself from shooting the occasional glass at the strange girl next to me. Throughout the entire class, she never relaxed her stiff position on the edge of her chair, sitting as far from me as possible, with her hair hiding most of her face. Her hand was clenched into a fist on top of her left thigh, tendons standing out under her pale skin. And this, too, she never relaxed. She had the sleeves of her white penley pushed up to her elbows, and her forearm flexed with surprisingly hard muscle beneath her pale skin. I couldn't help but notice how perfect that skin was. Not one freckle, not one scar. The class seemed to drag on longer than the rest. Was it because the day was finally ending, or because I was waiting for her tight fist to loosen? It never did. She continued to sit so still, it looked like she wasn't even breathing. What was wrong with her? Was this how she usually acted? I questioned my quick judgment on Jeremy's sour grapes at lunch today. Maybe he wasn't just resentful. This couldn't have anything to do with me. She didn't know me from Adam. Mrs. Banner passed some quizzes back when the class was almost done. She handed me one to give to the girl. I glanced at the top automatically. 100%. And I'd been spelling her name wrong in my head. It was Edith, not Edith. i never seen it spelled that way, but it fit her better. I glanced down at her as I slid the paper over and then instantly regretted it. She was glaring up at me again, 
her long black eyes full of revulsion. As I flinched away from the hate radiating from her, the phrase, if looks could kill, suddenly ran through my mind. At that moment, the bell rang loudly, making me jump, and Edith, Edith, and Edith Cullen was out of her seat. She moved like a dancer, every perfect line of her slim body in harmony with all the others. Her back to me, and she was out of the door before anyone else was going out of their seat. I sat frozen in my seat, staring blankly after her. She was so harsh. I began gathering up my things slowly, trying to block out the confusion and guilt that filled me. Why should I feel guilty? I hadn't done anything wrong. How could I have? I hadn't actually even met her. Aren't you Beaufort Swan? A female voice asked. I looked up to see a cute, baby-faced girl, her hair carefully flat-ironed into a pale blonde curtain, smiling at me in a friendly way. She obviously didn't think I smelled bad. Bo, I corrected her, smiling back. I'm Michaela. Hi, Michaela. Do you need any help finding your next class? I'm headed to the gym, actually. I think I can find it. That's my next class, too. She seemed thrilled, though it wasn't such a big coincidence in a school this small. We walked to class together. She was a chatterer. She, su she supplied most of the conversation, which made it easy for me. She lived in California until she was 10, so she got how I felt about the sun. It turned out she'd been in my English class also. She was the nicest person I'd met today. But as we were entering the gym, she asked, So, did you stab Edith Cullen with a pencil or what? I've never seen her act like that. I winced. I guess I wasn't the only one who had noticed. And apparently, that wasn't Edith, Edith Cullen's usual behavior. I decided to play dumb. Was that the girl I sat next to in biology? Yeah, she said. She looked like she was in pain or something. I don't know, I responded. I never spoke to her. She's weird, Michaela lingered by me instead of heading to the dressing room. If I got to sit by you, I would have talked to you. I smiled at her before walking through the boys' locker room door. She was kind and seemed to like me, but that wasn't enough to make me forget the last strange hour. The gym teacher, Coach Clapp, found me a uniform but she didn't make me dress down for today's class. At home, only two years of P.E. were required. Here, P.E. was mandatory all four years, my own special version of hell. I watched four volleyball games running simultaneously, remembering how many injuries I had sustained and inflicted playing volleyball. I felt a little nauseated. The final bell rang at last. I walked slowly to the office to return my paperwork, the rain had faded away, but the wind was strong and colder. I zipped my jacket up and shoved my free hand into a pocket. When I walked into the warm office, I almost turned around and walked back out. Edith Cullen stood at the desk in front of me. Impossible not to recognize her tangled bronze, bronze hair. She didn't seem to notice the sound of my entrance. I stood pressed against the back wall, waiting for the balding receptionist to be free. She was arguing with him now in a low, velvety voice. I quickly picked up the gist of her argument. She was trying to trade from six-hour biology to another time, any other time. This could not be about me. It had to be something else, something that happened before I got to the bi biology room. The look on her face must have been about some other problem. It was impossible that a stranger could take such a sudden, intense dislike to me. I wasn't interesting enough to be worth that strong of a reaction. The door opened again, and the cold wind suddenly gusted through the room, rustling the papers on the desk, wave, waving through my hair. The girl who came in merely stepped to the desk, placed a note in the wire basket, and walked out again. But e Edith Cullen's back stiffened, and she turned slowly to glare at me. Her face was ridiculously perfect, not even one tiny flaw to make her seem human, with piercing, hate-filled eyes. For an instant... I felt the oddest thrill of genuine fear raising the hair on my arms, as if she were going to pull a gun out and shoot me. The look only lasted a second, but it was colder than the freezing wind. She turned back to the receptionist. Never mind, then, she said quickly in a voice like silk. I can see that it's impossible. Thank you so much for your help. And she turned on her heel without another look at me 
and disappeared out the door. I went robotically to the desk, my face white for once instead of red, and handed him the signed slip. How'd your first day go, son? He asked. Fine. I lied, my voice cracking. I could see I hadn't convinced him. When I got to the truck, it was almost the, the last car in the lot. It seemed like a haven, already the closest thing to home I had in this wet, green hell. I sat inside for a while, just staring out the windshield blankly. But soon I was cold enough to want the heater, so I turned the key and the engine roared to life. I headed back to Charlie's house, trying to think of nothing at all. 